The target RL5, RI6 word meaning, is an important target because it helps us understand how language can be used in a sneaky fashion, if you will. We often don't say exactly what we are thinking. We like to use language to um, give double meanings, and this target is meant to help us unravel those double meanings in daily conversation and in the written word. When we take a look at the target, this is another one that really builds off of that one level. At the one level, you can determine the literal meaning of words and phrases as they are used in a text. In other words, you can basically translate it into your own words um, exactly as it's written. You may not pick up when there are double meanings to something that's on the page. At the second level, you can determine the meaning of words and phrases as they are used in a text, including figurative, connotative, and technical. In other words, at this point, you are actually able to understand if there's a second meaning and give that back. At the proficient level, for your grade level, not only can you determine the meaning of words and phrases as they are used in a text, including figurative, connotative, and technical, you can also analyze the impact of specific word choice on meaning, which you've already done, you found the meaning of it, and tone, in other words, the emotion or mood of the piece, especially with fresh and engaging literature, which is pretty much everything that we're reading this year. At the four level, the only difference is that you can deeply analyze the impact of specific word choice, and for our purposes, that means that you can give very specific word examples and get into the nitty gritty of why that one particular word matters. In other words, it's a close reading. The questions that I'll be asking you to help you show proficiency for this particular target will be one, what figurative language trick is being used? And I'm going to provide you with a very specific list of what you can look for. There's a lot of figurative language out there. We're not going to look for every single trick in the book. That'd be a little bit overwhelming for our purposes. So we'll just work with what I'm providing you next. The second question is, what does the quote mean? In other words, what is the connotative meaning? We saw that word in the previous slide as a part of the target. This is where you get into what it really means, not necessarily what it openly says. So this could be a double meaning case. Okay. And then finally, you've got what tone does the quote create? Again, that's the emotion of the piece. Okay. So what tone, emotion, does the quote create? And how does it do that? This is critical. You can't just give me an emotion word and assume that I'm going to understand. You'll need to talk about how it does that. Here we'll start going through the figurative language tricks that I will ask you to look for. Antithesis is one you probably have not seen before. It's the balancing of two contrasting ideas, words, phrases, or sentences. We have an example here from the Shakespeare play Hamlet with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage. And to understand how this is antithesis, we'll need to define a couple of words. Mirth is actually fun or humor. And then dirge is a funeral song. And they're combined here to show that there's some conflicting emotion going on. So if I want to talk about what this quote means, I would say, after I've identified that it's antithesis, that this quote means that sometimes we feel conflicting emotions. We might feel happy at a funeral, and we might feel great sadness at a marriage, depending on what's going on around us. What tone does this create? Well, because we're talking about a funeral and dirge, that to me really drags this quote down. If we were just talking about mirth and marriage, you'd be happy, but when you start talking about great sadness too, Overall, that makes a tone of sadness. Another example that you can expect to see is personification, giving human characteristics to non-human or inanimate things. An example, again from Hamlet, the air bites, it is nipping. Well, air can't actually bite. That is something that people do, and animals too in some cases. Uh, it is nipping, again, a word that you typically use for an action for something with a mouth, which could be a human. So what does this mean? Well, it means the air is very cold. So cold, in fact, it feels as though it is biting. Why did Shakespeare choose to use bites and nipping to create tone? Well, it almost creates a very violent tone here. I mean, if you have the air biting you, you're trying to get away from it. It's trying to hurt you. So we create a tone of violence, which in this case sets up a very dark and violent play in Hamlet. 
Two more common figurative language tricks that you can watch out for are metaphor and simile. They're very close to one another. They're basically making a comparison between two unlike things, and that's what's key here. You've got to be talking about two unlike things that could actually have something in common. The metaphor is just the comparison. The simile uses like or as. Two related examples here, the rose walked into the ballroom, and as a simile, she looked like a rose in her red dress. In both cases, what does this really mean? A beautiful woman in a red dress walked into a ballroom. This is probably a very positive tone if you're describing someone as a rose. This is usually a flower that has very romantic and beautiful connotations. You give roses to people that you love, and so the overall tone is one of great beauty or admiration. Our final two figurative language tricks that we'll be looking for are classical allusion and allusion. A classical allusion is a reference to people and places specifically of Greek and Roman literature, and an allusion in and of itself is a reference to a historical event or another text. As an example, he was powerful like Zeus. Notice there's a like in there too, so it also makes it a simile. And then an allusion, uh, just in general to history, like Washington, as in our former president in general, he braved battle for a good cause. In both of these cases, we are talking about powerful men, or in Zeus's case, a god. The tone that is thus created is one of power, uh, an impressive tone. If you're comparing someone to Zeus or to Washington, you are trying to convey that they too are very powerful and impressive and should be respected. All right, taking a look at a text that you are more likely to encounter in this particular class, we're going to look through Mark Twain's corn poem opinions again and look for some figurative language. I am persuaded that a coldly thought out and independent verdict upon a fashion in clothes or manners or literature or politics or religion or any other matter is a most rare thing, if it indeed has ever existed. Mohammedans are Mohammedans because they are born and reared among that sect, not because they've thought it out and can furnish sound reasons for being Mohammedans. We know why Catholics are Catholics, why Presbyterians are Presbyterians, why Baptists are Baptists, why Mormons are Mormons, why thieves are thieves, why monarchists are monarchists, why Republicans are Republicans and Democrats Democrats. Okay, so I see what could be perceived as some antithesis in here. Thrown in among all of these religious groups and political groups, we suddenly have... Why thieves are thieves, and why monarchists are monarchists. And of course, when you're in a democracy, someone who believes in monarchy might not be very popular. So we've got two very negative groups thrown in among religious groups, which are typically viewed as positive, at least if you're a part of that. Um, and so we might consider that some antithesis here. And when we consider what it really means, we go back to that first section, as we've talked about before. Uh, the overall meaning of this particular quote is that you believe what you are born into. And when we combine it with looking at the antithesis, you believe it good or bad. So that would be what the quote means. And then as far as a tone, well, when we're including negative words like thieves or monarchists, this is really putting a pretty dark cast over the entire sentence. I think Twain is trying to imply here that it's not good to simply believe what you believe in. And by pulling in on words like thieves and monarchists, in contrast to all these other groups, he's creating a more negative tone for the entire piece. Reading on, let's see if we can find any other figurative language. Men th think they think upon great political questions, and they do, but they think with their party, not independently. They read its literature, but not that of the other side. They arrive at convictions, but they are drawn from a partial view of the matter in hand and are of no particular value. We all do no end of feeling, and we mistake it for thinking. And out of it, we get an aggregation which we consider a boon. Its name is public opinion. Ooh, giving something a name, it's even capitalized, like you might see in a human name, could be some personification here. We're implying that public opinion is a person, and it actually goes on to uh, build on that. Let me finish writing this out for us. Some think it the voice of God. It has a voice. In fact, it's so powerful. It's like God. Oh, we've even got an illusion there. So we've got a double up here. Overall, what does this mean? Public opinion is extremely powerful. And the tone would be, I think, again, went a little bit dark here. I mean, do you really want public opinion 
um, not one individual person, not necessarily someone you can trust to be so powerful to be like that of God. So kind of a negative tone here, um, in part through the use of the illusion, the voice of God, especially when you look at it in connection to public opinion. So several examples there of figurative language.